Hello and welcome to the In The Money Players podcast. This is our show for, uh, what is it? It's March 25th coming up, I think, is the Saturday, uh, 2023. I know that part. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fortital, back with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again. As you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, the Brooklyn Bunker has been invaded by my daughter who has uh, replaced the In The Money sign with one of her own. I'll let you go and look at that. It's too cute to take down right away. We'll let her. We'll let her have her fun with that for for a show or two. I'm just surprised she didn't wait for April Fool's Day to pull that particular prank. My guest today is going to have pranks such as these to look forward to in the coming years. Always enjoyable stuff. He comes to us now from the planet Texas in his Houston Astros regalia. He is Nick Tamaro. Nick, what's up, my man? I'm doing great, my friend. It's already been uh, – the Astros have already encountered more injury problems in 2023 than they did in 22. So, Yeah, the Altuve Stay thing isn't good. Yeah, that's not, that's not, that's not good at all. Um, are they going to finally – and I say this as an interested uh, fantasy baseball owner. Are they going to finally put uh, Kyle Tucker in the two spot? You know, good question. I think it's probably going to happen. Um, I guess Pena could lead off. McCormick also could, but – yeah, it's going to be dicey the first 10 weeks or so. Um, Alvarez is also banged up. McCullers is not healthy. You know, Hunter Brown got scratched from a start the other night. So, yeah, it's uh, – for a team that was remarkably injury-free in 2022, it's already off to a rough start. We are going to be doing a baseball special, as I always like to do for opening day. But I will, uh, I will say, from a fantasy baseball point of view, one of the guys I'm banking on this year is also an Astro, Jose Abreu. I'm looking to have a big year. Oh, yeah. How has he looked? How's he looked so far? Yeah, been a good spring. So glad to have him. They wanted him ten years ago. Finally got him, and uh, <laughs> on and upward. From the all the better late than never department. Of course, we're not here today to talk baseball. We're here to talk horse racing, and it will begin with fairgrounds. Um, just to let folks know, we will be covering fairgrounds on the plus side. We can't do it with Frank McGoey, like Nick, like me, a little bit under the weather. He's a little bit more under the weather this week and was not able to record. But we will have our man Kevin Kilroy from uh, Fairgrounds on who does a great job and has been there on the grounds as well and talks to Frank and many others and is going to have lots of great info. So that one's going to pop up tomorrow morning. We've already got our Dubai plus show up. So yeah, we're getting back on the beam on the plus side. It's hard to do the plus stuff when I'm traveling and running around. So, so now that I'm back, we should see a much more steady stream of that on this show though. We will talk about the two big ones. We previewed them a little bit earlier in the week. I had barely looked at that point. Nick's opinions were already beginning to form. We'll start with the Fairgrounds Oaks, which goes as race number 11. And the more that I looked at this race, Nick, the more I liked uh, Pretty Mischievous. We just really, and this isn't from Frank, this is just looking at the work tab, looks to be working well. And I just feel like it has a good situation in here to build on her resume and possibly be the first of her generation to get away from this rather universal case of the slows, as you've described it. Who do you like in the Fairgrounds Oaks? Yeah, I agree. I think pretty mischievous looks like one of the it I mean what the winner should come from the outside three Phillies, right? And so it's it's a matter of who is going to maybe get the best trip pace wise. I like Saez on the Alice look quite a bit because he's gonna put her in play early. And um I think that'll guarantee that she's close. I think that'll give her the jump on on pretty much the other two. I know that the silver bullet day didn't really hold up to scrutiny based on chop chop subsequent performances. But I'm willing to go there. I think you're obligated to take a shot against Hoosier Philly. And so for me, the Alice look looks as good as anybody. So you'll go four. Uh, you're, you're looking four, three or. or yeah, four, I, three, five. I'm... OK, excellent. Excellent. Four, three, five. But really trying to beat the five in, in all meaningful uh, action. I'm going to take a little stand with Pretty Mischievous there and see if I can be right. But I do respect the Alice look. And if I could find a way to save if they if the board tilts towards who's your Philly, which the morning line did not. But if the board does, which it might, um, I would love to have some Alice look on there as well. In fact, I think I will. Interesting question as to how they're going to bet the race. Yeah, exactly. Maybe the hype, maybe the boom is off the rows of who's your Philly after the last appointment. And maybe they're going to tilt the board on pretty mischievous, which might lead me to leave this as more of a pass race than anything else. Let's proceed to the Louisiana Derby, which goes as race number 12. Uh, always interesting when they're going the mile and three sixteenths here. As we get a Susan cameo uh, live on the show, <laughs> you're getting your computer. Is that what's going on here? 
See, we have a family office at this point. Parents stealing the light box in the back. And sometimes when I'm doing work upstairs, we get Susan down here. I guess I could have unplugged that for you. I put the computer over here. I didn't realize she was <laughs> But anyway, we always love the family, uh, the family and pet cameos on this show. Um, Louisiana Derby is up next. We previewed this one a little bit earlier in the week. Nick, as you've looked at it more, how has your opinion uh, evolved? Yeah, you know, one of the things we touched on on Monday that or Tuesday that hasn't changed is that despite having a really bulky field, this race has very little speed, and and I think that that's going to be a factor certainly in terms of how it unfolds. Um, I think Jace's road is very dangerous. In that respect, I also think Kings Barnes is very dangerous because I do think that that Flavian Pratt's going to take advantage of uh, of that scenario. Um, those two, along with Disarm, are kind of the ones that I would probably want to focus a lot of my attention on. I respect Instant Coffee, but uh, I, I'm just not completely convinced that he's worthy of solid favoritism in this kind of scenario. So I, I would relegate him on my multi-race place to more of a backup. And I kind of focus on those three just because I think this is a race won by a forwardly placed horse. And um, the other one that I could be talked into uh, maybe a, a little bit if you, if you had to twist my arm would be Shopper's Revenge. Um, I mentioned him on Tuesday as well. I just don't think he's good enough when push comes to shove. And I'd be willing to gamble on those three. So I would uh, I would easily take the five, six and eleven. And what order would you put them in? I mean, do you have a top, a top pick amongst those three? I guess I'd pick Jace's Road on top. I mean, maybe I'm a. Maybe I'm a sheep that hasn't realized yet that it's not just that he doesn't like wet tracks, but that he's not that good. Um, but I'm willing to willing to die on that hill. The more I look at this arm, the more I like him in here. I feel like that last race had license to be a little bit short, late, and just I like the pace line. I like the way he was he was finishing up despite looking like he wasn't all the way back yet. And this is a horse that, you know, I, I just developed such strong opinions of coming out of that super fast maiden race at Saratoga back last uh, early August. And I think when you look at the pace map of this race, he's not going to be too far behind the likes of uh, the horses that you mentioned, Jace's Road and Kings Barnes. Yeah, I mean, Kings Barnes looking at time form could be loose. My issue with Kings Barnes, and I'll ask you this, your opinion as a, as a figure maker, there seems to be plenty of disagreement in terms of figure makers on just how fast those races have been. Um, and and that's that's what's giving me pause there. I mean, I feel like on the buyer scale, you're supposed to be <clears throat> him somewhere in here. But, you know, I have enough questions and I have enough questions about the, him potentially getting hammered given the hands that he's in that I was going to – maybe relegate to a to more of a backup role but what, what do you think very specifically about how fast kings barnes is it's a good question and it really ultimately is the question you have to ask yourself um from a figure you know if you're a, a, a speed figure devotee so to speak um you want to you want to look at it you know in about as roundabout a fashion as you can his time for us number for his last start came up very good so it's not a not a concern about whether he's fast enough there. The question is, you know, his buyer figures are, are a little lacking. I'm actually pulling up his thoroughgraph sheet right now to see what that looks like. And um, so his two thoroughgraph numbers are a nine and a four. So, I mean, he's, he's very fast on thoroughgraph. Um, yeah. So maybe this is a situation where, you know, this horse is just kind of sitting on, on an explosive type of effort. The other issue that you have to take into consideration is that tomorrow will be the first time without Lasix. So right. will he be able to take that big jump um, or will he, you know, just produce the same type of effort? Because I think we can agree that the same type of effort probably isn't good enough. He's going to have to take a step forward. And I think we're hoping that he does so with the advantage maybe of the of the pace. Favorable pace situations are the kind of thing that will help give you that bump. That's for sure. Disarm has to answer similar questions about Lasix. The other runner I want to mention who I'm going to use as an A it, and I don't think you agree with me on this one, but that's the nine Tappets Conquest. It, as I go through his races, I feel like you can say that in the allowance race on January 21st, that was a slowish pace and he did well to get as close as a neck. I think that the last day he just moved a little too early and that's what made him look a little bit hangy late. This is a horse that, you know, I know uh, Frank had really liked physically earlier in the earlier in the fairground season i think he could put it all together third start of the layoff at a price i agree on paper it mostly looks like this is a pace that could uh, hold together which would work against him 
but I think at the price, this is the kind of horse that he's like, he's like really kind of more a B, but he's such a value B that I'm going to go ahead and call him an A. Do you, do you see the case at all for Tappet's Conquest? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think you're making a, a the excuses that you're making are valid enough. So I should Let's say, but, um, yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're onto something, and I think you're going to get enough of a price this time around to really um, to, to take a little bit more of a of a chance. Um, it also just you know he doesn't look like he certainly isn't bred like a horse that should struggle in the last furlong and he kind of ran like it last time and and perhaps the argument that you're making which is that he the trigger was pulled a little early uh that seems valid enough so i I don't have a i don't have a substantial disagreement with it and you know i think you've made enough of a case to to give him a try at what should be a a better price and of course we really the key thing here is how the heck are they going to bet i mean tap its conquest we become some wise guy horse four to one i don't need Kings Barnes is actually six to one. He's absolutely an A. You know, we're, I'm making some guesses here about how people are going to bet. Um, I'm not doing a full horse by horse write up for this one for at the races. We do have a great write up of this race, though, by Eric Solomon, even with pictures now uh, over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com. And that's absolutely free. So folks should be checking out the Derby content on there this year. I mean, I just feel like every year it's gotten better and better. And then, Nick, you'll be part of our uh, Derby package for Plus. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But we are a little bit pressed for time today, and we have still have this Aqueduct pick six to get to, but I think we can do it. We're, we're professionals. We're going to go right there into uh, Aqueduct's fifth race, a starter allowance going a mile and three eighths on the dirt. Interesting distance. Nick, who do you want to use to start this pick six? Yeah, these uh, they're doing the – I don't remember what it's called. I guess the, the Claiming Championship Series is I what it's known as idea. now. Yeah. Yeah, I love yeah, the starter allowances for the hard knockers. No, I totally agree. And I think it gives them an opportunity to shine, which, you know, is always nice. This first leg looks like it's probably going to be dominated by the favorites. A good skate and tonal impact. They each are, are really suited to the elongated trip. And uh, tonal impact has definitely been facing better horses. He comes in off of uh, re- really a remarkable seven straight exact of finishes including all four since he was claimed by Linda Rice. If you've not been following Aqua closely, it's you know kind of been the winter of Linda. And when it's not been the winter of Linda, it's been the winter of Rob Atris. So no no great surprise there. Um, that tonal impact looks like a horse that that I think you'd want to want to give some extra consideration. The the mitigating factor I would say is that the pace scenario does look like it favors good skate a little bit more. So we'll see if he's able to uh, to get out and establish command. But I mean, no denying when they met two starts back, without with Goodskate not having the advantage of being on the front end, it was uh, it was a race the total impact absolutely dominated. Yeah, that's who I went with here. I think he's the right press pr- pl- uh, place to lean, and I love this pedigree for this distance. I mean, I suppose that could be a question. My other issue with Good Skate was maybe just also a little bit flattered last time out by how the track was playing. <laughs> now back facing tougher and this is an easier group than what uh, tonal impact faced last time i thought so i was gonna try to just press up the seven again we love you know we're talking about the pick six that's what our you know friends and clients uh, ask us to talk about but do not sleep on the wind pool at aqueduct and in all the naira tracks that's often where the best values are we'll see but i could i could imagine um if the market goes crazy for good skate and might make the market for a horse like tonal impact let's move to race number six where the the we have a three-year-old a maiden special weight this time around we are going one mile on the dirt and you tell me if i'm being too clever by half here nick but i was hoping that moore's law the forerunner could be an interesting alternative to the favorite here i had a just one of those notes that i like to make in maiden races for moore's law that he was the kind of horse that looked to be figuring things out about halfway through the race this horse was bet on debut in an interesting way. Wasn't hard bet, wasn't dead. Like it's like sort of in the exact area where I think this horse has ability, but wasn't expected to shine on debut. After showing that figuring things out look, I think is going to show a lot more as a second time starter. As Modeus, as a figure monkey, I have to use. The only concern for me was this horse was such a big price there. I can't rule out some regression at a short price with a potential serious rival at a decent price in the four Moore's law. I'm calling it the four is an a, the five is a B what's your approach to race six. Yeah. You know, the, the figure making part of it is, as we talk about pretty frequently uh, because it's the most objective way to analyze races and horses that 
that Asmodeus race is just very, very hard to to find a, a solution as far as what could have possibly happened because you know those two horses peeled off way in front of everybody else and um, Register came back to run in the private terms at Laurel and with Lasix and he finished last when I mean, he was East. So it's a you're supposed to be a little concerned about whether the figure is too high. It probably is too high. Moore's Law is going to improve second time out. The rest of these horses just look like the same kind of unappealing version of, of the same horse. So I don't I don't see why you'd want to spend any money on horses like Ride Up or um, the Firsters don't look like anything particularly tough. I, you know, it's a it's a Calumet horse for uh, Brad Cox. So, you know, those usually aren't the best types. They do outrun expectations sometimes. But no, I agree with you. Moore's Law kind of looks like he's going to turn into the universal good thing too. I mean, he's going to get pounded second time out. They're going to say Chad and the winner right. came back and won already. Um, this is a horse who was sort of figuring things out late, likely improves with distance. So yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't think that this horse will end up going off favored, but I wouldn't be surprised when all is said and done if their prices are really close to each other. Yeah, that's disappointing. Maybe I wasn't being clever enough by half. <laughs> Um, it, perhaps, although I guess the real question is, and this is, this is obviously a horse named by Seth Klarman. What is Moore's law? Do you have any idea? I don't, I don't have it. It's a, uh, we, we know what field it's from though. Do you, do you know it? I do not. It, uh, no, this is, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the one I was looking for. The number of transistors on a microchip doubles about every two years, though the cost of computers is halved. I've heard that. Yes, that's exactly what it is. That's okay, exactly what it is? I should have come up with that. Actually, that's I, pretty I, clever I, on uh, on Seth Klarman's part. That's uh, he's he's branching out a little bit. <laughs> well, these days, these days, the world of tech and finance are as inextricable as they are in horse. They're heavily intertwined. That is for sure. <laughs> and just one other data point. I know I, we can't camp out too fast. If we you 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 need to be out at ten. Yes. No, nah, I mean I can make that call shortly after. Okay, great. So then we don't have to rush too much. But so one other data point. Yes, Register bombed and was in a stake, so you could forgive that one if you wanted. But the other two runners to come back, minus four and minus six. I know this right. looks like the DRF formulator view. So, I mean, I think by all means that, yeah, I mean, I'm going to, in my brain, that 93 is more of an 89. Still very strong, but not not the, not the giant standout that it necessarily uh, looks like it is at first blush let's move on to race number seven where we've got a six furlong race on on the dirt here and uh nick i'm gonna throw it right back to you yeah and this is a good uh this is another good one i mean you've got horses that kind of were refurb projects as many of the cases in these races that now are going a lot better i mean the one that sticks out among those is silly key who was down dropped down all the way for 10 and um, and Linda undoubtedly salivated when she saw this horse drop that low, knowing the opportunities that were going to be out there for him in uh, some of these starter allowance events. The uh, the other horses that looked interesting to me, I mean, Lohengrin too, since he's been claimed by Oscar Barrera, he always had speed, but now he's like, he's supersonic fast, which is, is pretty interesting because, you know, you can see these kind of situations take place off of claims where horses maybe have their running style a tad altered and it can make a big difference. I do think he's dangerous in here because I don't really think they'll keep up with him. I know he ran off on Matty Oliver a little bit last time out, but Dylan Davis is in the irons now. He's dangerous. I still think the pace will be there for Silly Key. And if Silly Key doesn't quite get there, I would imagine Easy Day becomes the, the next likeliest winner. So from a multi-race perspective, I think you loan A the one and you back up the three and four. We're, we're basically in lockstep here. Same three numbers. Silly K makes a lot of sense. Just a tough, consistent type racing against lesser than what he's been facing. Easy day, obvious off the last uh, race. My only question about him and the reason I have him as more of a backup as, do, as you do too is I just feel like going back and watching those two aqueduct runs, the numbers aren't bad, but this horse has a little something extra at parks that he doesn't have at aqueduct. I'm, I'm feeling very um, confident in saying given uh, given the trips and opportunities that that were available but still fits so well on numbers i'm not going to be a hero and try to beat and then yeah the pace angle on the three undeniable so those will be the three runners for both of us in race seven which takes us to race number eight where we've got a six and a half furlong uh, contest and this one i felt like i could go through and make cases on on five different runners I'm going to talk about two of them. I'm very open to including others. The 5-0 Trouble does not have the perfect profile off the void claim, 
But the recent body of work is very strong. This horse is just a neck from being five for five. I like the post and running style for this one to get a good trip in this spot, second flight kind of a situation. And speaking of pace in here, I had another reading of the race where Bezos could potentially be the lone speed. So I wrote it out at first with the five as an A and the two as a B, but I made a very specific note to listen carefully to Nick and try to include some others in this spot, what others should be looked at. Yeah. I mean, you've got, and you've got a couple other horses coming in here, including ragtime blues for our friends, uh, Marshall. And I think Corey's involved in there too. Uh, that's coming in off a huge effort, right? I mean, it's coming in off a bit of a dressed up effort, but uh, they, you know, maybe they bought in at exactly the right time. Um, you have a horse who's a, a personal favorite of mine, having kind of kicked off my Gotham day in Royal Trist, but he looks like he needs a wet track. So, you know, I'm not as concerned about him. I didn't have terribly much to add to that. I do think the Bezos is dangerous with the, uh, the ability to set the pace. The blinkers are coming off, but I don't really think that matters. I think if anything, that slowed him down last time out. I think he just needs to, to be able to run free. Um, you know, what do you do with the voided claims? In fact, you, you brought up a ragtime blues already. Um, what do you do with the voided claims, right? It's, it's such a difficult thing to deal with, especially when you're, you're looking at a trainer like David Jacobson, who his horses are random, you know, they run well, they run poorly, their form just goes in and out left and right. He looks like a dangerous horse to me. I, I think I'd probably include him more out of fear than anything else. I do like Lunisima also. I thought that this horse ran a little bit too much mid race last time out, kind of hung in the stretch looking like he was going to get there. Uh, maybe he's a little bit more suited to sprinting and that's good. That's going to be my, my thought. I like the slight cutback. I like his price as well. How would you grade the runners you've mentioned here in the eighth? At this point, I'd pick the 10 on top and I'd make sure I have the five, nine and 10. Um, I, I could be talked into other horses like the two gotcha. as a backup. All right. That makes, that makes perfect sense to me. And I do think Looney Seam is one that I paused on for a long time and I'll, I'll be uh, throwing in, I'll throw probably all your horses in here, honestly, as I uh, put my ticket together and then we'll see what the board looks like in terms of a possible win bet there as well. Race number nine, we've got uh, the mile version of this starter allowance with uh, the Phillies and Mares. Four years old and up. I'll kick this one off because why not? Um, this is an interesting one where I wanted to play this for all kinds of different scenarios and was going to spread a little bit. The scenario that I wanted it to come was it's a fast pace, but not a collapse. And runners like Mosienko and know-it-all Audrey can get the best trips and get involved. I like the fact that Audrey's back on Lasix and dropping and uh, Mosienko second time off the layoff after looking flat. I can make sort of condition cases for both of them to improve. Of course, there's another scenario where the 11 tough street just bosses this field and buries them. So I definitely want to have the 11 covered. And then there's the other scenario where they all go too fast and then movie Moxie wins it for uh for, for the hot bar i don't want to commit to any of those scenarios i want to cover them all so i was thinking of for official purposes calling it the the uh the nine and the eight as a's and the 11 and the six as b's but in in truth i'm not exactly sure how i'm going to grade them out finally we'll, we'll see how it plays out but also i'm very likely to be influenced by your view of this race yeah, I think I like your movie Moxie scenario the best, um, just because I, I even though she's coming back on short rest, she ran against good horses last week, and um, I do think the the switch back to Jose Lascano, I think Jose is going to keep her a little bit more engaged without getting her very close to the pace, and I think ultimately that's the right kind of scenario, just because I get a little I get a little concerned about Tough Street against better competition when she has to do a lot of running early, and yeah, she's just beaten up on pretty much every New York bread you could find in this colony. But um, I'm not convinced that the, these horses aren't significantly better top to bottom than she is, especially a horse like know-it-all Audrey, who, you know, ran through her conditions very easily, quickly became a stakes horse, and um, and quite honestly has not embarrassed herself against stakes company at all. So I think Tough Street is, is, a, is probably the favorite on this card worth taking on the most because you you really do have good opportunities. And so I can see myself tossing her all together here and uh, really trying to focus on the uh, the six and nine. Um, I like your thought on Mozienko. I'm a little concerned about her in a mile 
but I, I do think that she's interesting second off the layoff. I mean, and look, there's no denying anytime Dennis Lohman puts a saddle on him, you're a little intrigued. Yeah, for sure. And I always like those, the stretch out horses with speed. I always give extra much easier than the, than the ones who are closing when they're going short. So should I write you down six and nine as A's and the eight as a B? That'll work. All right. One more race to talk about on this segment of the show. It is our nightcap. We are going a mile and we've got a field of 11. Nick, how are we going to get paid? You know, tough, tough spot here to close it out because you got a lot of these hard knockers that have seen each other before. Um, it felt to me like a race that would have enough speed to set the table for some of the closers. Um, there's actually, I, I think, more than enough pace. And I, I mean, I think when when push comes to shove, I think the interesting price horses are horses like Winter Pool and Hammer and Amor, who are going to be making up ground. Um, Daddy knows on the inside is committed to going to the lead. Black Belt on the outside is committed to going to the lead. I know he gets in light with Jason Wyas and is dropping in class, but this is a horse that uh, you just don't feel as confident that that South Florida form is going to be duplicated in New York. Similar situation pace-wise to me with no burn, Optic Way on the outside, Al Cools. I mean, all four of those horses all want to go towards the lead. That's why I wanted to gravitate towards some of the closing types. And the uh, the two for me were the four and five. I think speed figure-wise, they stack up. They're a little slow. Um, compared to those horses, but this is going to become kind of a, for lack of a better way to put it, kind of a slow horses race yeah. because the pace is going to get fast. It's going to get topsy turvy, and I think the horses coming from off of it are really going to benefit. I, I saw it similarly. Give me that final your, your final grading of them, and I'll run through my thoughts quickly, and we'll get out of here. I would I'd be four or five as A's, and um, some combination of the nine, ten, and eleven as backups. Gotcha. Just yeah, hoping. I I like that. I mean, you're covering you're covering scenarios there for sure. I put Hammer and Aimer on top, you know, and and it's funny you 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 already made the case. I mean, this this horse I'm hoping is going to be a long shot. Um, wasn't an easy trip last time. I like that race two back, and then I said the horse is a little slow, but this is a pace scenario where a slower horse can probably win it. And the other horse I thought could be suited by pace dynamics was Dust Devil. This horse is very good around the Aqueduct Mile, has some finish, and could be suited by pace dynamics. I was going to include Black Belt as the one I thought was the most likely to prove best of speed out of stakes and back on Lasix. I thought that could could help him find himself a little bit here. I was looking 5, 7, 11. I'm going to look a bunch more at uh, at your four runner in here as well as the race train just uh, keeps on rolling. Nick, appreciate your help here this morning and look forward to talking to you probably as soon as early next week to look back at fairgrounds and Dubai and, uh, you know, just generally catch up. Sounds great, my friend. Looking forward to it. The show will continue right after this. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you go over to wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to In The Money Media.